this is our second Sonic Speaker series of the season, and I'm very happy to welcome Anirban Mukherjee, who might be holding a, close to a record of one of the folks who's traveled the farthest to come out to uh, participate in a Sonic Speaker series. He's coming all the way from Singapore via Beijing. Um, and uh, Anirban has a really interesting background. So uh, he does come from India. He does have a background, like many of us, in a variety of different disciplines. But he did a lot of his formative work at Cornell and uh, has been primarily interested in issues related to marketing. And um, I've got to know him over the years. He's been working with us on one of our NSF projects with the Threadless data set, et cetera. But Anirban is going to talk about something quite different from that today in his talk. Um, he's, uh, he's right now a visiting faculty member at INSEAD in Singapore. Uh, before that, he was at SNU, Singapore Management University, also in Singapore. And uh, in addition to flying out to spend some time with us in Sonic, I'm happy to say he's actually going to spend a little more time also at Columbia, where he might end up spending the next year visiting uh, in the marketing department there. So I'm just delighted that Anya Brun is here to join us today. And uh, without further ado, uh, we're going to hear more about investigating the multiple source effects in product pitch videos. Thank you again for coming. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much for making the time to be here. Um, this is Work in Progress. It's uh, with Kathy Yang, who's at Orchester Paris, and uh, Hannah Chang, who's at SNU. Um, it's a project which sort of is near and dear to us uh, because it has sort of this uh, span that goes from consumer behavior, which typically is done in the laboratory, it's uh, behavioral work, um, all the way across to something that I think of as sort of emerging in the field of computational marketing, where the scale of the data is much larger. Uh, the econometric model itself is quite simple, but I think some of the variables that we're going to sort of define uh, are going to be distinct and different from what is typically sort of considered. Uh, so uh, let me just sort of get started and... Um, Why INSEAD? Actually, it's why not INSEAD? For me, INSEAD was my number one choice. It was actually either INSEAD or no MBA at all. The first thing that comes to mind, obviously, is INSEAD's name and its brand, how respected it is. It's the, the top five schools in the world. But more than that, it's the quality of the education. If you look at all the top MBAs, INSEAD offers a very unique 10 months program, which gives you a very, very good return from an investment perspective. As a finance person, that's quite important for me. And it combines the ability to study at two different campuses. I started looking at different MBA programs and found it. So in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. There are actually five speakers in that video, right? So NCR didn't pay me to present that video. <laughs> so this effect is called the multiple speakers effect, which is that you have multiple people come and espouse a position, give some information, and it's actually very common in practice. Um, you see this in, in courtroom dramas a lot. You have a lot of attorneys bring out uh, a lot of different uh, witnesses. Um, you see this in advertisements. Um, this is the Honda Yearbooks ad. Uh, you, you have people come in and sort of present their point of view. Uh, so this effect, which is the multiple source effect, um, another place you see it a lot is in political advertisements. Um, this effect has been studied in the laboratory. And uh, the first uh, piece of work, so this is, also, this is from Kickstarter, um, in terms of uh, context, this is actually the one I'm going to be studying. Um, and and if, you're, if, you're, if you like Dungeons and Dragons, there's a guy who came up with it. Um, so th this effect is called the multiple source effect. And the first paper that talked about it uh, was a paper that's uh, Hawkins and Perry, which is from psychology. So you might be thinking, what is the multiple source effect about, right? Um, there is one effect which is, which is just based around the idea that if a lot of people espouse a position, then you um, go with, uh, with the social norm, right? so this sort of this idea of conformity. What Hawkins and Petty found, which was interesting and distinct from this, was that it wasn't just about the nature of having many speakers. So it wasn't just the fact that there were a lot of people speaking, but that every time a new speaker came along, um, there was this idea of renewed uh, cognitive energy, this, this idea of cognitive stimulation. And, uh, and so you paid more attention to what it is that those people uh, were talking about. Right? So you derived, and, and underlying this idea, 
is that if I had, let's say, a random draw of five uh, undergraduates uh, from the Northwestern program, and they all came up and they said, you know, Northwestern is great because reason one, reason two, reason three, reason four, reason five, I would imagine that every one of them came from a different universe, and a different informational universe. And so the idea here is that because you have multiple speakers, you have distinct voices, you have distinct individuals, you, uh, you imagine that the information that's coming to you is coming to you from different sources. And so you pay additional information or additional attention uh, to each of these speakers who come along. So that's what's distinct about this, that it's not due to conformity pressures, as we like to call it, uh, but it's due to this idea that there is greater informational value that's coming from every one of these speakers. So I actually really like uh, this piece of work. Um, it's been tested. Um, it's been established. Um, would you say, like, um, does it matter if, like, the information is, like, say, re reinforcing a particular viewpoint, like, in the video, like, come in yet, versus, um, you know, contributing distinct kind of uh, criteria yeah. to support? Yeah. So right. this has been studied in the domain of persuasion, where usually you're trying to persuade them to do something. Uh, so, for example, one common context is this one. Uh, so here, this is information about a pizza restaurant, and the idea is, will you go to the pizza restaurant? So all the information is positive information. But what is true is that the nature of the information may vary, right? So some information may be more powerful, and some of it may be less powerful. And if you look at the Hawkins and Betty, um, the idea is that the, 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 the nature of the information gets magnified. So if the information you're presenting is sort of very weak, right? if it's sort of like uh, the pizza place is pink or it's brown, right? sure. it's, it's relatively irrelevant. I don't think people have tested out with negative information, but sort of information which is not as persuasive. Then you don't get source magnification, or at least source magnification has an effect. But to the extent that the information is powerful and useful, then source magnification has an effect. So I think your intuition is in the same direction, but as far as I know, um, in the multiple source effect, there really hasn't been testing done on negative sources of information. It's always all positive. Okay, thank you. Pretty much we're due to the tradition that, that they're coming from. Um, so here's one which, uh, which is sort of very popular apart from Hawkins and Betty 81 is that you know, uh, people were asked about a, a proposal um, in an academic setting, and um, they had multiple speakers present multiple arguments. Uh, what's also interesting here is that if you look at the paper, it's sort of very vintage 1980s psychology testing. It's very carefully done, it's very beautifully done, in which they said, you know, what if this information was brought in from a pool of information, right? So you had 100 people give out ideas, and four people are going to present uh, ideas chosen from this, versus for people who were just organically brought uh, to test these ideas. So lots of really cool works, and in advertising and in marketing, um, the work which was done was more in Reardon. It's not going to work because of, it's going to reflect, um, so I try not to use it. Um, but more in Reardon has tested this out, idea out in printed ads. Now where we came to this was that if you look at the laboratory, I think the laboratory is an amazing place to develop uh, theory, particular, particularly consumer behavior theory. Um, but one of the big limitations of the laboratory is that you end up with stimuli that are fairly simple. Right? So there's pretty easy stuff. I mean, the, the speed of dining is, is, is high. Uh, you know, you have high quality cheese. Right? I mean, it's a pizza place, right? This is, this is a, you, you mess up in a pizza place, how badly can you mess up in a pizza place? <laughs> um, right? it's, it's not a big decision, right? But what about a decision like this? Right? Now we're not talking about pennies anymore. I mean, NCI charges 80,000 euros a year. So you're talking about significant amounts of money of your time. And you can think of this in the context of education, of course. But you can think of it in the context of voting in a candidate. Uh, you know, your presidential candidate comes to mind. Right? Uh, you can think of it as in terms of buying a car, buying a house. So more complex judgments, much, much more complex information. And if you actually go through that video, you, you'll see that they talk about relatively distinct topics, not topics that sort of are simple and, and aligned with each other, but relatively distinct topics. Uh, what happens in that context? 
right? That's yeah. that's what drove us to this uh, to this idea. So conceptually, uh, what we propose as a conceptual framework um, is that if you if you have complexity, the extent to which complexity is likely to mediate uh, this relationship and the directionality of it is unclear. Right? So on on the one hand, what might happen is that if you have a situation in which you have complex information, if people are able to parse that information, they're able to process that information, renewed cognitive stimulation, additional attention to the message, will mean that you'll have greater persuasion. So essentially, people will pay more attention to that NCR video, they'll, they'll think about all of these different aspects of that video, they'll think about the process, they'll be more likely to, uh, to apply for NCR or, or try to attend to NCR. Okay? On the other hand, there's another literature in what we call information overload. So, you know, we're, we're boundedly rational creatures. And when we're boundedly rational creatures, we have limited cognitive processing power. So if it is the case that the information is quite complex, then what's going to happen is that when you have multiple sources, the second source will come along, you pay a bit more attention. The third source will come along, you pay a bit more attention. But the likelihood of information overload will go up. And if that happens, then what we'll end up with is decreased persuasion, or at least persuasion that stays flat. Okay, so that's, that's essentially where we're coming at it from. And we argue that this is not something that we would have seen in the laboratory in the previous stimuli, because they were relatively simple stimuli. And, uh, and the pizza's example is, I think, uh, a pretty descriptive one. Yeah, well, I'll follow your logic. The decision for NCI is a more complex decision than the decision for pizza, right? Yes. And so yes. because it's a more complex decision, I've already used my resources thinking about that decision, and then I don't have resources left uh, to consider these multiple sources. Is that how to follow along with this? Um, so uh, let me maybe restate that a little bit, right? So to the extent that you have cognitive resources that you're going to deploy, in understanding this decision. Um, in, in the case of NCR, if the project is complex enough, if the video is complex enough, if the idea is complex enough, then each time you will try to uh, apply your cognitive resources. You pay attention to the message. But if you think of cognition, it's a two-step process. You pay attention to, to, to the message, and then you have to process the, the, the message. So it's in the processing phase that you'll have information overload. At the end of watching the video, you'll have gained all this information, but it'll be hard to process all of it. You'll not, you will not have, you'll not be persuaded to action. Okay, right? so it's not in the complexity of the decision, it's in the complexity of the information that's being presented? That's correct, okay. that's correct. And, and I, I mean, to, to be completely fair and honest, the two are fairly interrelated, because to the extent that the decision is being determined. So uh, I think in some sense you might be coming at it from the perspective of there being a decision to attend an MBA program. Uh, here the entire decision is going to be defined by the video I show somebody. It's the only information you have. Okay. Right? So the video, the, the complexity of the decision and the complexity of the video are basically internet because okay. whatever you see here is what you what you know. But if it's on, oh sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I've got this. No. So you're using um, GoFundMe as your platform for this? Crowdfunding. Oh, uh, sorry, Kickstarter. Kickstarter, sorry. Um, so isn't the decision the same, right, which is to give money or not give money to the Kickstarter campaign? Oh, I see, participate or not? Yes, but I mean participate or not in the context of um, the decision of to participate in a project which is more complex versus a project which is less complex. Okay, I got you, I got you. I'm here now. <laughs> Any other questions? Just please stop me as I go on. Okay, uh, so yeah, so we are in online crowdfunding, and I won't spend much time on this because I think we're all in a tech focused school, so you know, you know what, what crowdfunding is. And uh, the process is quite simple you've got a creator, the creator puts up a project, uh, people make pledges, and then they get the rewards. It's, it's rewards based crowdfunding. And also, if you've been sort of on Kickstarter, particularly on the mobile page, you know the video really matters. That's the first thing that sort of pops up. So that's where we're going to pay our attention. Okay. So uh, um, this this project is interesting to me because um, we have we started off um, 
looking purely at the crowdfunding data. So we, we scraped a lot of crowdfunding data, and I'll describe it in a bit. And we found the effects that we expected to find. And then we went to management science with it. And we actually went to their, um, their data analytics track, the big data track. And then the response we got back, so we have a reject and resubmit from them. And the response we got back was to go back into the behavioral laboratory and to test some of the theory. So that's, that's, uh, uh, that was interesting to me because I had expected that a big data track would ask other questions apart from go to a small data source, but that's what, that's what they did. Um, so we said, okay, right? And so this is uh, one experiment that I'm gonna talk about. And if you'd like to talk more, I'm happy to chat more. Um, we, uh, we are running one or two more experiments to do the same thing. So here what we're going to do is in order to trace the theorizing uh, to see if it's accurate, uh, we're gonna vary two factors. The first is we're gonna vary the cognitive load. Right? So the amount of resources that you have, right, to, get, to get to your point, the amount of resources that you have to undertake the task goal. And then we're gonna vary the number of speakers. So how do we do this? Well, we use a very simple manipulation, which is that at the beginning of the experiment, uh, we give you a number. Right? If you're in the high load condition, you get this guy. And some people actually manage to remember this number. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty long number. And if you're in the low road condition, you get the number on the right hand side. And then once you've been given this number and you've been asked to remember it, remember it, and you'll be asked uh, to, to sort of enter this number later. And also I should mention that uh, we do our best to essentially take away papers and pens and stuff like that. So you can't write it down. Then we show you a video. The vision was to make charging your phone as simple as placing it on a surface. And to achieve this vision, we created the world's first long-distance, wireless charger with a range of 40 millimeters. Charge your phone on a surface by placing the charger underneath it. A true wireless charging experience that disappears into your environment. Introducing Inner Qi, the invisible fast wireless charger. Simply mount your Inner Qi wireless charger using the adhesive mount or screws for more permanent fix and begin charging your phone. With Inner Qi, you can charge your phone with any organic surface such as wood, granite, marble, glass, quartz, through thick cases like and pop sockets. So here's what we did. Right? We took a crowdfunding video, we stripped out the audio track. Mm -hmm. right? We transcribed what the audio track was. And we had two conditions. In the one speaker condition, so we have five different voices. These voices are coming to us from Amazon Polly. It's, uh, it's synthesized voices. Right? So in the five voice condition, we had the five voices sequentially um, go through the script. In the one voice condition, it was one voice. It's Latin squares design. So we have five videos with, um, uh, with single voices, and we have five videos with five voices. We just go through them in sequence. Right? Uh, we pre-tested this. Uh, not, quite, not very um, sort of surprising to see that people could figure out that there were five different voices. And uh, the way that we did this in terms of um, doing this through technology is that uh, we use FFMPG to strip out the visual uh, information that's on the right hand side. And then on the left hand side, um, Amazon Poly has uh, packages in R, so you can directly use the API, uh, create the voices, and then you just stitch them back together. So what's really cool about this is that the visual field remains the same, the information provided is the same, I don't give them any textual information. The only information they get is from the video. And then we can ask them a decision question. And the decision question was, what is your willingness to pay for the product? So on the left-hand side is the low load manipulation. This is when you're asked to uh, memorize the number 49. So when, when you're asked to memorize the number 49, in the one speaker condition, the willingness to pay is 44. In the uh, five speaker condition, the willingness to pay shoots up to 47, 48. 
which is what you would expect, right? So it's the multiple source effect. Essentially, when the voices are changing, then people are paying more attention to the messaging. But as soon as you put them under load, you notice that, that so this is not, the difference is not significant, even though the mean estimate is a little bit lower. Right? As soon as you put people under mental load, they no longer have that ability to engage in, in, um, uh, in renewed stimulation, and so there is no effect, and this is, this is identical to the one speaker condition. So this is, the, this is what we have in terms of experimental evidence of the theory that, uh, that we're looking to test um, in terms of is there a multiple source effect, um, and to summarize here, so if, if the number of speakers effect is more pronounced under the low cognitive load condition. Um, so I, I quite like this. It's one of the first examples I've seen of using synthetic voices in marketing research. Uh, and what it allows us to do is control for things like pitch. Uh, you know, because we, we could have had RAs sort of quote this up, but nobody ever speaks the same. And so you get lots of other issues that come about, but here you can control for volume, you can control for everything else. All right, so let me, yes, sorry. In your uh, pretest, you asked people how many voices they hear? Yes. What was the number that they said for the five voice condition? Was it five or was it? Yeah, so the median is one in five. Um, I forget the mean. Okay. I think it was uh, one, so one voice is one. Right. So nobody really says anymore. But I think it was like 4.3 or something okay. like that on average. Okay. So in the pretest, we asked people to, um, pay attention to the voices. In the actual experiment, we did not. Okay. We did not want to cue people to the multiple source of it. So, okay. Because right? we run completely separately. Could, there's some stuff on like change blindness with sound, right? Uh -huh. So like you can switch out people's voices and if people aren't paying attention to it, they don't, they can't necessarily tell that there's been a shift in the voices. I don't know if yeah. you yeah, can yeah, tell yeah. it or not. So, uh, no, and, and you know, particularly with the synthetic voices, um, one of our biggest concerns, so we tried to use Google WaveNet, and Google WaveNet voices sound better than the Amazon Poly voices. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that Google WaveNet's voices are all identical, or very, very similar. Mm -hmm. So even we really couldn't tell the difference between the Google WaveNet voices. <laughs> so the Amazon Poly voices, they have seven voices, we tried to pick the five, where there was the most distinct pattern. Got it. And we also tried to go male, female, male, female, male, female, Got right? It. To amplify that as much as we could. Um, I forget what the mean is when we don't ask people to pay attention to it, but I think it's in the vicinity of about 2.5 voices, two and a half to three voices. Okay. Yeah. Um, so ideally, they really would sort of note the differences in voices. And amongst human beings, it's easier to do with the synthetic voices. It's a little bit harder. Any other questions? Okay. So um, let me talk a little bit about the um, the data itself. Um, so this was actually what where the project originated. Um, it's data from the inception of Kickstarter all the way to February 2017. There are about 30,000 different projects. Um, we chose the categories very carefully. We wanted categories that related to product innovation so that we had a very simple in a decision, are you willing to pay or not? Because uh, with stuff like movies uh, or um, music, things are a little bit different. And we also wanted the category to be a little bit larger, so we could put a category fixed effect in our analysis. Um, the project product selection is quite simple. Uh, it's got a project video. So you end up with about 30,000 of these spread, uh, 24,000 after some more filters in terms of dropping things uh, across nine different categories. So uh, what does the data look like? Uh, well, this is what the data looks like, right? In terms of the raw data, you've got your video, you've got some information, you've got some text below it. Now, this is the other part of the project that I think is really interesting. Um, and in fact, to, to me as a quant, and somebody who's more interested in computational marketing, this part is even more interesting than the consumer behavior stuff. So, uh, Hannah Chan is the CB person, I'm the quant person, and Kathy sort of floats between the two sides. Um, so why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting because if you think about a project video, okay. if I was to walk back in time, just five years, I could not analyze this data. I could analyze it using RAs, but I could not analyze this at scale. 
And I really want to sort of wash out the variation, because right? I mean, the variation here is enormous. So how do we analyze visual data at scale? That's what drove me to this project. Right? So the way to do it is that first we split the stream again to an audio track and a video track. So on the right hand side is the video track. The video track is essentially 24 frames per second multiplied into the number of seconds. Now just to make life a little bit easier, we sample these frames, we don't track all the frames. But what we use is we use a deep learning model that categorizes what is in every image that we sample. So if you look at this particular, you know, all of us sitting in this classroom, if you run it into the deep learning model, it will say stuff like chairs, tables, people. And our idea here was that sort of similar to your idea of change, right? To see is the visual field changing as well? Can do we, can, because we need to, we need to account for change in any way. So it could be the case that we would misattribute the multiple source effect otherwise to any change in the environment. So I need to track the extent to which um, there is a change in the environment. I wanted to track the extent to which there was a person in the, in the visual field. Um, so we, we first go through this to build our visual controls. We go to the audio track. Okay. Now you're left with 24,000 videos of various lengths. Three minutes, five minutes, six minutes, seven minutes. Again, the old-fashioned way is to essentially have an RA sit there and transcribe everything down. <coughs> the cost implications on that would break my research budget 10 times over. Mm -hmm. So that was not going to happen. So what do we use? We again use a deep learning model to build the transcription for the audio track. Because we need to account for what people said. Well, that's not enough. I also need to measure different voices. I can't do that using a statistical model because people speak differently. But just because I'm speaking at a different tone doesn't mean that my voice is different. Right? So you need to actually account for how the voices are different. So sitting out here is a deep learning model that is essentially doing two things. It's taking the audio track, it's spitting out a transcription of the audio track, and it's spitting out how many speakers are there in terms of the audio track. A little bit later in the presentation, I'll show you a few visuals on how accurate this model is. Uh, for now, I'll just describe the overview. So until here, this is deep learning. But of course, our theory predicts a little bit even further, which suggest, what we're suggesting is that it's not just the fact that you have multiple speakers. It's the fact that the complexity matters. Right? Because this is one of the challenges of sort of working with, with marketing data sets and is that we want to do theory building in marketing for consumer behaviors. So for that, we, you know, the, the conceptual framework really matters. So in order to understand what was said here in terms of how complex is the message, we build a latent Dirichlet allocation model. And that is topic modeling, which essentially accounts for the nature of the content that's being described. So that's where we get topic modeling to get number of topics, and that, that allows us to have, and we have some tonal controls in terms of uh, the nature of set. Let me show you a little bit of the data. Um, so this is- Can I ask a question? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Did, did, you, uh, did you do some kind of like checks or tests to see how good this, these deep um, yep. learning results were as compared to getting it validated by manual coders? So I, I will actually show you the results oh, okay. right at the very end. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, and yeah, absolutely, I, I promise you that. Any other questions? And then for uh, breaking it out into frames, was there some, did you do it every second or is it every um, So seconds? right now it's every 15 seconds. Okay. It's every 15 seconds. Okay. Um, I mean, we ran this in, in 2017 in the beginning. Uh, today we could do it every second. At that point, we didn't have the hardware. Watch the the sign on every fifteen. It's just an engineering decision. Okay. It's it's a cost. Trying. <laughs> That's all. Okay. There's no there's no real reason around it. Uh, also, to be very frank with you, um, we built all these controls in because we thought that people would ask about it. A, people don't ask about it, and B, they don't seem to matter. Okay. Right. So when we do our econometric analysis, it doesn't really end up mattering. Okay. I just want to count for it. So we end up with 15. Um, if you look at the videos, I would actually say that the content changes 
every eight to 10 seconds. Right. So every snippet, like people say a sentence, and within the sentence, the visual resolution remains the same. Then all, as soon as that ends, they usually switch over. So if I went back in time, I might have done it every 10 seconds. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, let me give you a sense of what the data looks like. This is the logarithm of the pledged amounts. Whole bunch of zeros. This is in um, powers of 10. That's about 10,000. Right? And, and why I like this is that if you think about projects in which you're trying to fund from your relatives, family, and friends, you know, up to about here. <coughs> this is all family money. Someone's going to give you 10 bucks, 20 bucks. This is, this is 10 bucks. 50 bucks, I can see it. 100. Right? But once you get around here, you get to serious money. Okay. If you could raise $10,000 from your dad, then you wouldn't go crowdfunding for it. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. So there is, there is actually quite a bit of data from projects that raise serious money. That's, that's quite interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, here's the number of speakers as detected using the automatic algorithm, using deep learning. Uh, large number of projects with one speakers. Many of them were two or three. By the time you hit about five, which is what we had with NCR, uh, you've covered most of the data. It's a small amount of data right? that goes beyond six. Okay. Then, yes, quick question. The duration of these videos are? Three, to, three minutes of the own average. Three to five minutes. So it's within a fairly uh, narrow range. Okay. Yeah, so uh, it, it's not limited by Kickstarter. But empirically speaking, it's about three to five minutes. Uh, okay, so uh, you know, I, I, I don't know how much um, uh, sort of to in discuss topic modeling. Um, if you're familiar with it, uh, then you know, pardon me. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I, I let me just sort of uh, get everybody to the same page. Um, so, if you think about um, let's say uh, uh, something like a Wikipedia article. The Wikipedia article describes one topic of information, um, one subject of conversation usually. Um, so that's, that's sort of the uh, canonical example here. Um, if you think about a crowdfunding project, a crowdfunding project may describe the process of the production, um, it may describe the product itself, it may describe the prices, it may describe the timelines, so there are various sorts of information. What topic modeling does is that it takes information content and essentially discretizes it into bins. Each bin is a topic. And if you think of it that way, then the generative model is that for every document, you've got some mixture over the topics. So you're focusing on a different number of topics. Now, our argument here is that the reason we need this is that from the raw data otherwise, it's difficult to infer how many different topics of information did you cover. So if you run a topic model, then you get that. But in fact, this itself would not be enough. Right? The reason it would not be enough is because I not only need to know how many topics did you cover, and now I have a probability membership, but I need to know what was the distribution like. So did you cover two topics? equally, or one topic 90% of the time, second topic 10% of the time, and the rest of the stuff is basically easy. That's different. Right? To uh, distinguish between this, what we're using is the information entropy over the recovered topic distributions. And I really like this measure because I think it's intuitively very simple. If at the end of LDA, what um, LDA says is that this project video only focused on one topic, then my entropy measure will go to zero. Because this guy is going to shoot down to zero. If that happens, it goes to zero, we're done. Okay? If on the other hand, it says that you covered a little bit of many different things, then the entropy measure is going to be very large. So I'll get a really nice metric that summarizes the extent to which you're dealing with complex versus simple videos. Um, so here's what the entropy distribution looks like. There are very few that only focus on one topic, but you, know, you begin to see some simpler projects, some slightly more complex projects. 
So it's a nice normal distribution, which is what I think I would have expected. Um, so here is the complete um, econometric model. Uh, we've discussed how much was the amount that was pledged. We've discussed the number of speakers. We've discussed the information entropy. Um, three audio controls in terms of duration, it was the length of the, the video, uh, the loudness, um, and the rate, right, at the speed at which people are speaking. Maybe that's around change. Um, there's actually a deep learning model which sits around this. So this one's not ours. This is uh, from IBM Watson. It's the tone analyzer, right? So it basically analyzes the tone of what was being said um, in order to control the content. Maybe there's a correlate there. And then in visual dynamics, which is coming from the sample frames, what we have is a, a basic idea of dynamics that for these sample frames, how many unique tags were present. The more the number of tags, the more things were shown to you. Tables, chairs, people, things of that nature. Um, the matching accounts variable essentially looks to see from the transcribed audio and the visual field, are you showing what it is that you're talking about? So in the phone charger video, for example, you would expect that phones would show up in both the visual element as well as in the, um, in the audio track. Uh, and I also wanted to account for the presence of a person, which is just averaged out across the different things. So, um, you know, here's the simplest, uh, some, sometimes uh, when I present this in economics, people want to see the actual distribution of data points. You can, is just a lot of, of a blurb around it, right, because this is, anytime you're dealing with crowdfunding data, there's a lot of noise around it. Uh, but the effect size here is actually quite large. Um, we're going again in powers of 10. So going between 1 to about 5 or 6, you're going from about 2.8, sorry, sorry, 3.2, 3.3, all the way out to about 3.4, 3.5. So it's actually a reasonably sized puff right, in, in, in the logarithmic scale. Um, if you do this in a very simple sort of setup, where simple and complex is a median split on the entropy. So simple projects are those which have entropy less than the median entropy, and complex projects are those which have entropy greater than the median entropy. And then what you see is that you've got this interaction effect that's coming about, which is centered around three. Right? So as soon as you have complex projects with multiple speakers, the efficacy of having multiple speakers goes down. That's what we're saying. The efficacy of having multiple speakers goes down. What we're not seeing actually here, because the theory is silent on this, is what is the net effect? Uh, the theory only tells us what the moderation will look like. Okay, uh, so here's the full model. Um, you know, we've got all our control variables and everything thrown in. There's only one interaction term, which is the number of speakers in entropy. And um, I want to talk just a little bit about indigeneity here. Uh, so, you know, the, the challenge here is, of course, how do you attribute the pledged amount um, to just the video? Right? Now, I mean, uh, to be very fair and honest, I would say that, you know, uh, in various models, what I've done is, in addition to this, I have thrown in things like the topic and densities. So if you have topic and densities, both from the textual field and the visual field, you're essentially accounting for everything that was said in the video. You're accounting for everything which was said in the video, accounting for everything which is said in the text, and Noshir and I were talking about this yesterday, you're accounting for the whole universe of possibly what is observed. Now, you know, there is obviously something left behind in terms of Facebook data or some share. But I, I find that a lot of the emphasis personally in these sorts of applications with endogeneity is a little bit overstretched because it comes from a time when we observe nothing about people. And now we're observing 50 variables of other people. So you really are accounting for it. But that said, there might be a concern. And so what we rely on here is that if you look at the data, the vast majority of project creators are amateurs. Like there is a sense of serial entrepreneurs. We don't see them in crowdfunding. I found this really, really interesting. Even people who are successful don't come back onto Kickstarter very often. So 95 7% of the project creators only launch one or two campaigns. 
And if you think about what is it that you will do, right, when you're launching the video, our argument is that you will emulate. That you will emulate. Which is you will look at the most successful and the least successful videos, and you'll basically say if a lot of the very successful projects use lots of speakers, you're likely to use more speakers. If a lot of the least successful ones use more speakers. So we take the average number of speakers and the entropy for the 25 most successful and the 25 least successful uh, projects in your category two months prior. So it's essentially just a lag model, with the idea being that at the time that you're designing a crowdfunding page, you're looking at all of these things. One or two months later, you go and you go. Uh, so these projects are ended. And, uh, and the other thing here is important, is that actually in the data, uh, we have very little data in terms of participants. We have excellent data on Kickstarter in terms of projects, lousy data in terms of participants. But if you look at the participant data, Two-thirds of people only back one project. So the extent to which you have any kind of feed forward, right? That's also quite limited. So uh, you know you run your standard uh, partial S statistics and things like that, and that's that's all fine. Uh, it's really no problem here. Uh, you can you can check with the Durban Go Yeah, fine. So what do the results look like? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six are sensitivity analysis. Oh, sorry, are, are sequential analyses. Uh, so here I'm throwing in kick category fixed effects, then I'm throwing in category and month fixed effects, category, month, and year fixed effects, the addition of audio controls, tonal controls, and then the visual controls. And across all of the uh, different specifications that you have, you see a consistent pattern. It's actually very, very consistent. And this comes back to your, you know, why every 15 seconds, as you can see, actually doesn't end up making much of a difference. Your point estimate is, is fairly robust right, um, between the two. So um, I, I would say that I'm very comfortable uh, with the evidence in saying that it supports a negative interaction, right, which is where our theory comes. Uh, we did run a whole battery of sensitivity analyses. And um, we, you know, we, when we sent the paper to management science, we sort of tried to clean this up as much as possible. <coughs> so all of those are true. Now let me come back to Moshe's question. right? So how accurate is this stuff? So what we did was we couldn't code all the videos, but we asked mTurkus to code 400 videos. Uh, 398 to be, to be precise because we randomly distributed it. So if you take the difference between what was coded automatically and coded by human coders, it's centered around zero. Centered around zero. This is a slightly positive skew. And the reason this is coming about is because when the algorithms are detecting um, the changes in voices, noise is pushing the estimate a little bit towards the right-hand side. And when humans are detecting the change in voices, then there is, it's, it's hard to detect that change all the time. So on average, I think we are very accurate. But I think what's happening is that you know, if you had somebody sitting out there sort of very, very carefully paying attention to it, then they would be more accurate than my human coders. And if I could really denoise this, right? That if I had somebody sort of speak into a professional grade microphone instead of speaking into sort of like a webcam kind of a version, then my algorithm would be accurate. So there's a slight distinction between these two. Um, what about, so I showed you the results with just the algorithmic coders. What about, if you read and the model, with just the human coders. This is down to 398 different data points. Three, sorry, 331 after 30. So we had actually coded up 398 data points. You actually end up with point estimates that are very, very similar. And you end up with the same significance. Right. So, um, so actually, it turns out that, um, surprisingly, uh, the algorithm is, is pretty accurate. Now we're gonna, um, uh, so, um, can I ask you another question? Absolutely. Go, to go back to that slide, are there ways of checking through human coding some of the other deep learning features that you put into that? Um, okay, so I think in terms of... Like the matching, for example, between the audio and the video. 
So, yeah, so I think the transcription accuracy can be checked. That's a good point. As well as the, um, so, these are so these are based on supervised data sets. The deep learning algorithms are based on supervised data sets. So, as long as our data source is relatively close enough, then I think our accuracy levels will map onto what you get in validation for the deep learning models. Yeah, so for the example yeah. for the IBM one. Yeah, yeah. I'm not that concerned about that because yeah. I've yeah. seen yeah. a lot of data that leads yeah. me to conclude yeah. that's yeah. pretty good. I'm I'm just not familiar with some of the others, hence my question. Uh, yeah. how much how much of the others have been validated, the other ones that you are using? Um, reasonably as far as we can tell. Okay. That you know so we are using transfer learning here yeah. and we've tried a different a few different iterations of it. Um, I, I, my own sense is that, like visually, we've gotten extremely good. Right? So you can use like just a standard Resonance 50 kind of model, and you'll do very, very well. Audially, we're there, um, and we're getting better, but we're not at perfection. So when you look at the transcription, it makes sense, right? but it's not perfect. But at the same time, actually, the, the data source here is very noisy. That's, that's the other problem that we have, which is that you know, the, uh, the, the way people speak is different. Sometimes they have music playing in the background. So what exactly is being picked up um, is, is a little bit messy. See, I look yeah. at this data source and think it's really clean. We collect data from experiments mm -hmm. where the mic is not even close to studio quality or right. you know yeah these people right. are trying to be as good as possible that's right. trying to pitch that's an right. idea and they want yeah. money from you right yeah. 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 we are paying that's these people true. a small amount of money to participate in some cases in experiments and so yeah. our data is much it's, it's much much easier than uh, this and, and so I, i'm just i'm just i mean i i'd love to i mean i think nilufar you mentioned a few weeks ago that our colleague Diego says you can just do all this audio transcription without having to get human people to do it. You, you've done that here. Yeah, I'm yeah, just yeah, yeah. I, That's why I, would, I was curious about how, because we spend yeah. tens yeah. of thousands of dollars on getting yeah, yeah, humans yeah. to transcribe so, these So data. there are two possibilities. One is to go through something like Speechmatics or a, an API-driven process uh, through commercial providers. Um, I would definitely say Speechmatics is the leader in mm. this. Mm. They're based out of the UK. Uh, slightly more expensive. Um, the challenge with Speechmatics is here their customer service is horrendous. Right? Their the principal scientists refuse to talk to us when we are we trying to deal with them, which is ridiculous. Uh, and B, they force you to limit the rate at which you are feeding the information to them. Um, the other option is something like Amazon. Um, and uh, the Amazon services, Google services. So I think if you have a source of data that's large enough, the commercial providers are fine. Uh, but the other thing we really did here was data cleaning. Uh, you know, so when I ran my topic model, I was very, very careful. We, we went through all of the word stemming, sort of taking out the uncommon words. A lot of monkey business needs to be done there. If that's there, then I think the rest of it's good to know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, OK, so. Uh, so broadly, I think we arrive at the same, same um, sort of an idea um, uh, that as long as you have very complex projects, um, it's not as good an idea to have uh, more speakers. Uh, the multiple source effect works better with simpler uh, projects. Um, and we do find that this is economically quite important in terms of of, of an increase is that at least for the median project, you see a 15% increase in pledge funds with the, in, with the increase of one speaker. So it's actually quite a good presentation. Um, okay, so contributions. Um, one set of contributions is entirely to the persuasion literature. Uh, this was something that was tested in the 80s, and I think one of the reasons the uh, the literature did not expand on this view as much, is simply that creating stimuli was extremely difficult. And in fact, the vast majority of the research that has been done on the multiple source effect has been done using printed media or just pure videotape kind of conversations. And I think what, what we like about uh, this project is that with the idea of synthesizing sound, right, 
Now you can test other ideas around it. So, you know, people talk about the rate at which people speak being persuasive. Well, rate used to be really hard to control, right? You can't tell your RA speak faster or speak slower. But now you can. You can tell Polly to speak faster or slower. And you can tell it to within plus percentage terms. Right? Speak at 80% of the speed or 90% of the speed. So I think in terms of persuasion, the, the, the extent to which we can examine this phenomenon has sort of fundamentally changed. And I find that really exciting. Um, the other thing which is really interesting to me is that there is actually a growing literature on crowdfunding. And the challenge for the literature on crowdfunding is that it takes a perspective which is very applied, which is not really a challenge per se, um, because there's certainly a lot of value to that. But for people who are coming at it from a perspective of psychology or sociology, in terms of theory building, it's hard to do causal inference when you have so many variables. Uh, what we try to do here is to extend this literature, which mainly focuses on the economics of crowdfunding. Right? So there's a lot of the theory literature around it, there's a macro literature around it, and so there's sort of this idea of signaling um, towards the fact that, you know, why are people crowdfunding? Um, surely there is one part of the story that they want to support innovation. But there's another much simpler explanation. You want something cheaper, and you want something which is cutting edge. That is, you as a consumer want to buy something. And Kickstarter is just another avenue to buy the product. And I actually think that this is a dominant explanation for people who are not family and friends. That people turn around and they say, you know, should I support this project, get a discount, get it first? Or should I wait for them to finish the Kickstarter, be successful, then they'll have an online shop and I'll pay 10% more, but things will be a bit more guaranteed. Um, the literature that I can see in crowdfunding doesn't take this consumer perspective. As far as, uh, it, I'm, I'm obviously overstating the case a little bit, but I think that's the other part. The other part where I sort of kept a few minutes to talk about, and I'd love to collaborate and think more about this, is that more broadly, right, if you look at what happened in, let's say, uh, the mid-90s to late 90s in computer science and IS, and in marketing starting about 2004, 2005, 2006, uh, we had this huge sort of change, like a sea change in marketing, where people started looking at things like word of mouth reviews, uh, you know, coming to sort of the threadless kind of an idea. Uh, people started looking at all of these sort of crowd-based measures, and um, and they sort of said, "Well, this is really interesting." And those papers got thousands of citations. But this entire space of audiovisual analytics was left unexplored because almost everything that has been done, I'm, I'm again extending a bit too far, but almost everything that has been done in word of mouth comes from either purely numerical ratings, number of likes, right. number of, um, uh, of positive votes, negative votes, uh, or it comes from textual analysis, reviews that people have posted. And yet, if you look at the nature of communication, right? I come from marketing, so that's where I, I live. But if you just look at the nature of communication, the dominant change that's happening is in terms of audio and video. Podcasts have gone from 9% to 26%. Radio, 21 to 68%. YouTube, 20 years ago, didn't exist. 10 years ago was something a little obscure. Today, I can guarantee you Northwestern's bandwidth has been consumed by YouTube. Because every student is watching YouTube at the back. There is a huge change that's happening. Mm -hmm. right? Go back four years in time, we couldn't analyze any of this information. Uh, product reviews are posted on YouTube. We couldn't analyze any of that information. But what's happened now with deep learning, and this is the part that I think speaks to the theory of deep learning, is that, uh, or speaks to the theory of marketing, is that finally we know not just the positive valence of ratings information, but the positive valence of the YouTube videos that people are posting. Um, another, another important data source here is TripAdvisor. Okay? So I was talking to Pierre Chandon, who is at uh, NCR, and he works on food marketing. And you know, if you look at food marketing, it's the same thing. Uh, we have all these restaurants, and we've analyzed them for years, saying, what cuisine are they serving? Well, yeah, but now we have TripAdvisor, so we can actually see 
right? How much cheese is on the cheese nachos? Like, is this a healthy restaurant or not? I can quantify that. And I think that is a completely different world. It's going to lead to really, really interesting research questions. And so to summarize, I think the vast majority of marketing research and communication space phenomena is almost entirely relied on numerical ratings or written ratings, Yelp reviews, things of that nature, online customer reviews, uh, product descriptions is common, marketing communications. But that space substantively managerially has transformed from a written domain to an online audiovisual domain. And I think there things have is is sort of one of the places that I'm really most excited about this. So uh, I'm out of time. These are my two wonderful collaborators. Uh, the person on the left is a quant like me. The person on the right is a consumer behavior person. And so it's been an interesting ride. I sort of feel like I'm this person. <laughs> Thank you very much. Happy to have you. Questions? Hi. Um, I have questions related like extensions to your work. Yeah. For example, like if I'm not wrong, like understood in terms about this multiple effect in terms of how many people are talking, but uh, are any other kind of um, explanations according to, for example, um, since we are seeing right now in the industry of movies or marketing, like just like we're trying to provide more details from a people just like who can endorse this so it's like it's that kind of the effect that it creates this like and i think that's the main question there. so I, I think that's a really interesting question um if you look at the laboratory research um you know e even in our case we created stimuli for two different videos in the lab experiment together that cost me about eight hours of my life right and the reason for that was the the audio clip had to be timed with the video clip. So I was sitting out there saying one second delay, 0.5 second delay, you know, so the nature of what has been explored is very limited. Uh, the, the studies which were done in the 80s, the typical racial composition was white male in, in the studies. Some of them were white male and white female. Nobody looked beyond that. And as much as possible, they kept it uniform. So the heterogeneity or the question of diversity in the people who are uh, coming out and presenting the information, <coughs> I would go out on a limb and say that it's relatively, if not completely, unexplored. Uh, and it would definitely be very interesting. Okay. Uh, we could we could do some extent of it in our in our case. Uh, we don't have a deep learning model that categorizes male versus female versus uh, weak. And now you can have Q. So you're, yes. you're familiar with the, the gender neutral version gender neutral voice that just came out. Oh, is that right? Just in the last, uh, I think it was in the last couple of months. So one day, this is a, a this is a European company that's come out with a voice called Q, and you listen to it, and it is very uh, intentionally gender neutral. So you really can't tell. <laughs> and they are hoping that one day it'll be an option for places like Alexa and Siri, etc. Mm -hmm. Just called Q, mm -hmm. the letter Q, that's it. Thank you. So I'm curious on uh, two things. So. Um, first, I wonder about the main effect you find yeah. there. More people lead to more funding. Uh, if that might also be a proxy for just like resources used to make the videos, because I would mm -hmm. assume that having more videos, mm -hmm. but more people talking means it costs more money uh, to mm -hmm. make the video. Mm -hmm. And there's some way maybe to control for professionalism of yep. the video made. So, like you mentioned. Yep. Uh, good mics versus bad mics, and yeah. this guy nailed yeah. it like a huge audio file. I didn't know there was any difference, yeah. but apparently you could tell the difference in the way things yeah, sound. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, is there something you could? Is there some way to like capture that in your audio yeah. learning model, where you could say this, these videos are more professional or less professional, or use good mics or bad mics or good video quality or bad video quality? So that, that's a really interesting question. Um, I haven't seen that done in the space of audio and video. It's done in the space of um, text. And the way people do it is with spelling. Makes so, sense. You know, so spelling errors is the same idea, professionalism. Um, and you could probably think of a few other metrics, uh, uh, grammatical errors and spelling That's errors. That's an easy one, that makes sense, right? yeah. yeah. So um, uh, in our case, we probably could do it. I haven't thought about it, to be perfectly honest. Okay. Uh, 
it, it might be a bit challenging because the waveform that we're getting is coming directly from the video and it incorporates everything. So okay. sometimes people speak softly, sometimes people speak, people speak loud. And the, uh, so, yeah, I mean, in theory, one could develop a deep learning model if you had enough supervised data uh, to, to distinguish between videos or audio quality that sounds more professional and less professional. Okay. Uh, we haven't gone there yet. Mm. I had a question that actually ties back to what you said we used to do, yeah. but we don't need to do it anymore. Um, and an example is in things like Threadless, for example, um, where we are trying to predict people's ratings yeah. based upon what they might have seen or the, had discussion about the so text on the internet to the video. Yeah. To what extent are you able to control for the decisions to donate based upon the amount that has already been pledged so far, for example? Is that a hidden? Is that hidden? Or are people seeing yeah. that? And to what extent? Yeah. Might that yeah. be confounding yeah. some so of this? So that is definitely in the, in the field study, that is one of the biggest problems that we have. The way I think of this is as potential. So you know, so you can think of funding potential of a project. Or in the movies literature, this is called the box <coughs> office potential. So based on an underlying video, what is the potential that it can reach? Mm -hmm. uh, because there, there certainly correlates here uh, regarding social dynamics, right? right? Uh, they're hurting behavior of some sort. Right. Uh, there's also correlates here in terms of people sharing. So, you know, more successful one means you're gonna get more Facebook shares organically, which is going to lead to, <coughs> we know this happens. Uh, the, and, and that's, I think, one of the reasons the effect size is so large. It's not, it's not the case that a person is 15% more likely to purchase, but it's the fact that they are more likely to purchase, they are more likely to recommend, and the net effect of having the whole thing come together is 15% of the revenue. So that's so we we we're, we try to be, we're trying to be careful around saying causality in terms of funding potential, uh, and and that was actually the, one of the reasons that uh, management science wanted us to add the experiments mm -hmm. because there the data is at the participant level, and we no longer have this issue of you know. Uh, unobserved correlates of any sorts. Yeah, um, really cool stuff. Something like, uh, I guess it's uh, related to the professionalism of the product. Um, I like the endogeneity piece that you had, and I'm just curious, like, um, for you to speculate on, like, other types of ways for you to, I guess, like, quantify the similarity versus the differences of videos. Because I was imagining People who try to mimic, you know, the most successful projects that they ever viewed. But um, what features could you kind of think of that could help you understand? Um, is it like having yeah. like sweeping views of a product? Is it more minimalist shots or you know multiple people in a video? Oh, I see. So you're you're thinking about the image field. The image field, I have less information, and it's it's sure. basically from a pure engineering perspective. Because I mean, I don't uh, I don't have the talent that's there in this room in the sense of you know, dedicated developers. So I run this stuff on my own machine. Sure. And uh, and so uh, it, it, there's less that I can do there, but with the textual stuff, what I was thinking of was looking at the same topic intensity as so a prior video. So people were discussing the same thing you're discussing, right? Okay. I think that would be the easiest way to maybe solve this problem. Um, where we are with this project, I think our emphasis has shifted a little bit more to the experiments for some of the reasons that Nosher outlined which is that there you don't have the endogeneity issue, and then the field study is gonna come in more as descriptive analysis, and we're even considering dropping the endogeneity piece entirely there, to just say that, you know, here's where we stand, that descriptively, here's how the, the phenomena occurs. So the causality and the theory testing happens a lot more in front. So sure, that's all right. Sure. Yeah, thanks for saying. Yeah, I think we're out of time, so you can join me in giving a round of applause. As a token of our appreciation, we have an old-fashioned pen, fountain pen, with a sign on it that you can take back with you, etc. And I know you still have some meetings and, and lunch and so on and so forth. So thanks again for coming for the talk, and we'll see you back at the next uh, speaker talk. So there's at least one more this quarter, and we'll see the announcements. Thank you again.